This assembly will come to order. Please remain standing for the invocation. The college chaplain, Jeffrey McCarn, will deliver it. In this special season, let us close our eyes as if we could face East together in the presence of the sacred, whatever form, image, or reality that may assume for us, and kneel to the life that lies before us, and pray for a coherence to arrive and meet us at the highest level of our carefully examined conscience, which orients us to the way forward and discards no one, but instead celebrates and seeks out the serious goodness shining like the sun somewhere in each one of us. Compel us to exchange the culture of the lonely drive for notoriety and distinction, a battleground which leaves many scarred and scared, and trade it in for the rich and joyful feast at the table of human belonging. Shalom, salam, namaste, palms together, jam up, jelly tight, amen, all right. Please be seated. We will now hear from the Honor Court Chair, Evan Weinstein, Class of 2019. Administrators, faculty, fellow students, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. To the class of 2022, welcome and congratulations. Today ends a remarkable and improbable journey to get here to this moment. Today begins a remarkable and improbable journey that will see you use most of Hamilton's vast resources. In a moment, you will sign the Hamilton College Honor Code. It affirms that you will treat your attendants here and your peers with the gravity they deserve. It is not a mistake or coincidence that all of you are sitting in this auditorium. This school saw in you promise and potential, pride and purpose, dignity and honor. My sincerest hope is that you will see these things in each other the Honor Code puts this hope to paper. It is a commitment we all share to better our community, to help each other, to study hard and to learn. It makes real the abstract. The Code is a tradition at Hamilton dating to 1912. As Hamilton changes in big and small ways, for better and sometimes for worse, we continue to work we continue to commit ourselves to the lofty goals laid out for us by ourselves, our peers, by our professors, and all who have helped us get here. The Honor Code represents the best of Hamilton and its students. I ask that you sign this code and reflect on all that it took to get here and all that it will take to get through the next four years. Thank you. signing, please pass them out to the aisles.
It is now my honor to introduce the 20th president of Hamilton College, David Whitman. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. A special welcome to the class of 2022. After hearing some of your orientation stories, I'm delighted and a little bit surprised to see that all of you are here. <laughs> Members of the Lower Saranac Lake group, you know what I'm talking about. Just for future reference, although it's not actually a violation of the code of conduct to chase bears, it's not generally recommended either. <laughs> Today marks the start of Hamilton's 207th year. It also marks the start of your first year. So give yourselves a round of applause. We come to this campus at a time of intense political polarization in this country and abroad. On issue after issue, from the environment to taxes, immigration, health care, you name it, liberals and conservatives are talking past each other or not talking to each other at all. But not to worry, Democrats and Republicans have at last found something on which they agree. They agree that higher education is moving in the wrong direction. Now, I'm all for finding common ground, but that's not what I had in mind. But that's the result of a recent Pew Research Center poll. Among those who think higher education is heading in the wrong way, most cite high tuition. They also think college does not do an adequate job of preparing students for careers. And most Republicans, although not so many Democrats, think colleges and universities worry too much about protecting students from views they might find offensive. Let's consider the claims. Sure, tuition is high, though I think we should have a full discussion of the economics of higher education before we assign blame. But for now, let me just say, most of our spending is on people, the faculty and staff who will make your Hamilton education life-changing. Sure, we could make do with fewer people, but quality would suffer. As Bill Bowen, the former president of Princeton University has pointed out, it still takes four string players the same amount of time to play a Beethoven quartet today as it did in the 19th century when the piece was first composed. You could play the piece faster or with fewer musicians or with less talented musicians, but it wouldn't sound the same. At some point, of course, the analogy breaks down. Adding a fifth musician, no matter how talented, won't improve a string quartet, but adding faculty and staff does improve higher education. It means smaller classes, a richer curriculum, better student services, and better extracurriculars. So is tuition too high? I know what some of your parents would say. A few years ago, a study by two economists at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Jason Abel and Richard Dietz, estimated the average annual return on investment from a college degree at about 15%, net of tuition, fees, and opportunity costs. So think about that, an average annual return of 15%. Returns vary by major, of course, but even in the lower paying disciplines, they estimated an average annual return of at least 9%. By contrast, the stock market historically has averaged about 7%. Put another way, college graduates, on average, earn well over $1 million more than workers with just a high school degree. As Abel and Dietz note, the college wage premium is near an all-time high. So if you can find a better investment, let me know. I'll invest. But as, as important as the financial return on your investment may be, I hope you're here principally because you care about the intrinsic value of your education. Hamilton will expand your horizons, open your mind, and enrich your innate capacities. It will prepare you for a rich and fulfilling life. I'm not just making this up. As the current president of Princeton, Chris Eisgruber, notes, survey data show that college graduates are happier, healthier, more likely to exercise, more likely to vote, and more engaged in civic life than those who haven't gone to college. What about the second claim, that colleges and universities fail to prepare students for careers? Skeptics sometimes argue that the value of a college degree lies entirely in its signaling power. The degree shows employers who have the smarts to get admitted and the tenacity to stick it out. 
but maybe it says little about what you've actually learned. To what extent that may be true of other colleges, I can't really say. But our alumni will tell you they learned a whole lot. How to work hard, think critically, write clearly, speak persuasively, how to evaluate quality in artistic and other domains, how to engage with multiple cultural traditions and perspectives, how to live and work productively and harmoniously with others, how to be empathetic, and more. So trust them, a Hamilton degree will serve you well. The average college graduate changes jobs four times within 10 years of graduation. In a world of such rapid change, a broad and deep liberal arts education may well be the best career preparation you can find. So what about the last claim, that colleges are bubbles of political correctness? A few weeks ago, Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General of the United States, put it this way, through trigger warnings about microaggressions, cry closets, safe spaces, optional exams, therapy goats, I didn't know there was such a thing, and grade inflation, too many schools are coddling our young people and actively preventing them from scrutinizing the validity of their beliefs. That is the exact opposite of what they're supposed to do. Rather than molding a generation of mature and well-informed adults, he concluded, some schools are doing everything they can to create a generation of sanctimonious, sensitive, supercilious snowflakes. All right, points for alliteration. <laughs> there is some irony in this critique. In the highly polarized contemporary environment, more and more people live in information bubbles. They get curated news tailored to their existing political beliefs and cultural norms. So if college students do wish to avoid views they find offensive, they are not alone. Even so, it would be a mistake to dismiss the Attorney General's critique out of hand. It may be something of a caricature, but we should be, something, we should be sensitive to the risk of avoiding dissenting views. Shunning those who think differ differently is an illiberal response, not in the political sense, but in the academic sense. It runs contrary to the goals of a liberal arts education. You will learn by engaging those whose views and perspectives differ from your own. This sounds simple, it isn't. On many college campuses, protests have erupted against speakers perceived as expressing, or likely to express, views offensive to one or more segments of the college community. Hamilton does not tolerate actions that prevent guests from speaking or that disrupt the operation of the institution. But I hope you will do more than simply tolerate other viewpoints. I hope you will seek them out and engage them on the merits. Last year, we launched Common Ground, a speaker series that brings together leading thinkers with very different perspectives. Our goal is to, is to model the kind of dialogue that will help all of us re-examine some of our own beliefs and assumptions. Part of your education here lies precisely in exploring new ideas and new ways of thinking, and in getting to know people with different identities, backgrounds, and perspectives. Doing so will not be without friction, it will not always be easy, and it will not always be comfortable. But easy and comfortable are not part of our educational mission. Intellectual, social, and moral development are, and they occur when we confront new ideas and consider other perspectives. You have four wonderful years ahead. You will make friends, many of them friends for life. You will have experiences of all kinds. You will learn and grow in ways you could never have imagined, and you will have fun. You may even learn the words to Carissima, although I personally am still struggling with that. You'll see a lot of me in the coming weeks and months. Please say hello when you see me on campus. Let me know how you're doing. Maybe let me take a selfie so that I can send it to my daughters who have expressed some skepticism at my claim that students love me. <laughs> but most important, spend every day making the most of this magical place. Welcome to Hamilton College. I'd now like to invite our new Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculty, Suzanne Keene, to join me at the podium to receive the signed Class of 22, 2022 Honor Codes. Evan, would you bring up the signed codes? Did you count them?
I am pleased to accept the signed honor codes from you. As a member of the faculty and their dean, I serve in this ceremony as the representative of the academic integrity that stands as a central ideal of Hamilton College. Though it is ceremonial, this rite is not an empty gesture. It marks with meaning your entrance into a community of trust. You enter into your Hamilton College education so that you may know yourself, be who you are, and find your future. Those are worthy aims, aims so important to us that we call them promises. Now it may appear that the college is promising to deliver those results to you as an individual, but the phrasing is important. We won't tell you who you are or sign you up for any specific outcome. Those promises are actually tasks that you will undertake over the next four years. Along the way, the faculty will ask many things of you, and the very first one was this pledge of your honesty. By pledging your word of honor with your signature, you have joined a community of trust. I receive these cards on behalf of a faculty who are guided by similar professional codes of conduct in their teaching and in their scholarly research and creative lives. The most visible sign of our commitment to academic integrity are citation styles, those systems called Chicago style, APA, MLA style, and there are many others. You will almost certainly learn to use more than one of these styles with facility, and pro tip, ask your faculty member which citation style to use if it isn't specified in a writing assignment. Some subjects come with very specific expectations for documentation of sources, and all subjects taught here require original work. You won't plagiarize. Using citation properly not only announces to your reader, behold this honest work, but it does something more generous, something that extends beyond a badge of honor worn by an individual of integrity. Citation shows the next reader where to find what you found. It is a form of sharing, the fundamental virtue of living in a community. For academic integrity means not only documenting your sources, it also means opening yourself up to others' different interpretations of those sources. It says, I am willing to hear your alternative view on the matter. I am willing to show you why I have come to my conclusions, and if you can test them based on my evidence, I will thank you when you show me your evidence. In a community of integrity, it does not harm our own points of view and positions to entertain alternatives. We know that we do not make specious claims ourselves, and we believe that others adhere to the same high standard. Of course, we warn each other when fake news is contaminating the well of truth. There are statements that we read or hear out only to recognize or denounce for their malicious intentions. But in the regular give and take of discussion, exploration, interpretation of results, of discovery, our individual pledges of integrity draw a proud line around our boundaries. Hamilton College is an honest place. They also mark out a zone where we can create common ground. Out of differences come understanding, not capitulation to a prefab set of right answers. Your pledge of academic integrity marks your commitment to a community where our distinctions and differences, our identities and perspectives, become our shared resources. Joining this community symbolically located on a hill, placed here in the first generation of our nation's founding, reminds us that Americans have frequently seen themselves as exceptional and separate, bound together by oaths and pledges that exclude a world that disagrees with them. This is not our way. Many people with different messages will visit us here. Indeed, some of you may even be reading what they are tweeting even as I speak. We are part of the world, and there's no barring the door that will work for us. Indeed, when Hamilton College was young, the new nation had just committed itself to a free press, to free speech, and to freedom of assembly. The founders placed their trust in arguments and demonstrations. They gave up the ideas of separatism and religious tests that had drawn so many of their great-grandparents to this continent. 
American democracy was far from perfect then, and it is far from perfect now. But it is constructed to sustain itself through the arguments of the people. As a result of those disputes, today we draw the lines of community much more inclusively than the founders could have imagined as we attempt to understand and repair the damage of racism and sexism and other structural and institutional systems of exclusion. A few days ago, I read the encouraging words of a Hamilton College student on a national news website. Nicole Taylor, class of 2019, reports that today's college students are energized by the opportunity to vote. This is excellent news and not the first sign that your cohort may indeed be a great change-making generation. In response to murderous violence in your schools, you have shown us the face of a defiant young citizenry. And you look different. I don't mean the shaved heads and the piercings. You look smart and brave and exasperated. You are inspiring. We are counting on you not to lose heart. Disregard the hateful messages that are intended to demoralize you, or better yet, point out their flaws and failings. If you are a citizen of the United States 18 years or older, the very best way to avoid being disenfranchised is to exercise your franchise and cast a vote. But there are many people in this entering class who are citizens of other countries and some who have come to this country in the hope of a better life. At Hamilton College, all are invited to participate in argument and contestation, in the testing of alternatives in conversation and experiment that are the warp and weft of our democracy. We have come a long way from the humble cards vouching for your intention to do original and honest work, your individual promises. You are already internalizing a sense of personal integrity that will be a permanent aspect of your character. By accepting these cards from you, I accept you into a community where together we will challenge one another, care about one another, and as the foundation for the work we do together, hold one another to the high standards of mutual trust. Thank you. On behalf of President Whitman, I invite Vice President and Dean of Students Terry Martinez to come to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh my goodness, you can do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. President Whitman, Dean King, distinguished faculty, and fellow colleagues, welcome again to the newest members of our student body and to those who are returning, I send you warm greetings. I am so glad that you are all finally here. I can't wait to have conversations with college students again. My 16-year-old nephew spent about a month with me this summer, and I've grown pretty weary of watching videos of the Kiki Challenge having in-depth tutorials on how to perfect my floss or swipe dance moves and trying to understand Fortnite, which I apparently first heard as the not so popular kitchen utensil video game, Fork Knife. <laughs> I look forward to hearing about your summer jobs, internships, or travels. Today marks the beginning of a new year in an ever-changing campus community and national landscape. As you go about your daily interactions and pursue your learning, I ask that you consider your part in making this campus, our campus, a healthy and a safe one, one that is welcoming to its members of its, to members of its diverse composition. We are all in a unique and fortunate position of being in a community which we get to shape, whether it's in the classroom, on the field, or in your residential community, how you show up defines the experience for yourself and for others. And how you show up matters. Wherever you are on your journey to know thyself, I can assure you this will be a journey that extends beyond your time on the hill. Your actions and your behaviors matter. Are you creating, serving, contributing, 
observing, agitating, or dismantling. Whichever you're doing, know that each has an impact and sometimes unknown consequences. That impact may be on the collective community or on, on, or on an individual in the room next door. Your conversations and interactions matter. There are lessons all around you, all the time, and countless opportunities to engage in them. You will most certainly learn a tremendous amount in each of the classes you take, but there are other spaces that will contribute to your learning as well. Take the opportunity to engage. Taking risks and stepping out of your comfort zone are all part of that learning. Taking a leadership role in an organization will teach you how to work with teams to solve problems or implement a created plan. Competing on a team will teach you leadership, execution, and time management. And serving on a committee will provide insight into organizational development. Take the opportunity to find someone whose perspective on an issue is so incredibly different from your own and engage in a deep and meaningful dialogue with that person until the early morning hours if needed, until you understand that person's perspective. Listen intently and ask more questions. By more questions, you move into the unknown and may experience deep learning that will spark something new in you. Along the way, don't forget to take care of yourself. The most basic things you have learned along the way matter. Sleep for at least seven to eight hours consistently. Please don't fall into lack of sleep Olympics. If someone tells you they only slept three hours the night before, don't compete in that game. Make healthy choices in the dining hall. The new all-you-can-eat plan should not be taken as a personal challenge but one that will allow you to eat when it makes most sense for you. Physically move for at least 30 minutes a day. Ask a friend to join you for a walk. Try a new activity such as yoga or Zumba, or convince your sweet mates to create an intramural team. Reflect on what you have accomplished each day and prepare for the day ahead. Reach out to a peer counselor in the counseling center to talk through a challenge you are facing. These things allow you to be responsible for your own well-being and to ultimately do well in your coursework, engage in healthy relationships, and to make better decisions. I hope you all have a great year, and I look forward to catching up with each one of you again. Please take time to take care of yourself and each other. Welcome to Hamilton. It is part of our convocation tradition to award a number of scholarships and prizes. The descriptions are in your program. I will announce the names of all the award winners and ask them to stand. I will announce the awards by group as they appear in the program. If you are the winner of an award, please stand and remain standing. So I'm going to repeat that because people always forget. If you're the winner of an award, please stand and remain standing until the next award is announced. I would ask that everyone please hold their applause until the end of each group. I'd like to begin by recognizing the recipients of the prize scholarships. The Benjamin Walworth Arnold Prize goes to Jonathan Stickle, Sarah Salimi, and Craig Angert. The Robert Bankert Prize to Paul Turner. The Captain Gerald Fitzgerald Dale Scholarship to Gabriel DeJoseph. The Charles Dana Prize Scholarship goes to Carly Abraham, Catherine Rychek, Madeline Hustiano, Aaron Pimentel, Diana Perez, Savannah Kelly, Hope Preston Medina, Sean Conroy, Theodore Simpson, Isha Parkey, Gavin Schaefer Hood. The dual German prize scholarship goes to Chi Chun Hu, the Donald Hamilton Prize to Ligia Mendoza. The Ann Miller Hardin Prize to Nanaka Suzuki. The Matthew Houlihan Prize to Grant Kiefauer. The Edward Huntington Memorial Mathematics Prize to Levi Lorenzo and Benjamin Oltzik. 
the Grant and Silas Keen Prize to Jean Jong and Isha Parkey. The Willard Boswick Marsh Prize goes to Colleen Wall and Carolyn Sullivan. The Marcel Moreau Memorial Prize to Eleanor Silva. The Oren Root Prize Scholarship goes to Robert Treadwell and Chung Chi Guo. The Arthur Soper Prize Scholarship in Latin goes to Emma Nelson. The Chauncey Truax Prize in Greek to Stephen Clement. The Vrooman Prize Scholarship goes to Alexandra Ham. The Lawrence Yurti Prize to Samantha Kapan and Yo Zheng Song. Let's congratulate our prize scholarship winners. Now we will recognize the winners of achievement prizes. The Brockway Prize goes to Craig Engert and Katherine Rychek. The Class of 1990 Scholarship to Aaron Pimentel and Amari Lee. The CRC First Year Prize in Chemistry to Sarah Pierpont. The Dr. Edward Fitch Prize in Greek to Katherine Pierce. And the Dr. Edward Fitch Prize in Latin to Theodore Golden. The Francis Gilbert Prize goes to Jaden Knight. The Leo Macta Prize in Physics goes to Robert Taylor and Hannah Burrell. The Phi Beta Kappa Book Prize goes to Wahong Kai, Craig Engert, Benjamin Gardner, Alexander Kurtz, Elijah Maris, Juliana McCann, L. McCusker, Minduk Pham, Sarah Pierpont, and Katherine Rychek. The Rusty Smith Memorial Teaching Prize in Computer Science goes to John Hay. The Winslow Prize in Greek to Julia Stevens. The Winslow Prize in Latin goes to Madeline Cavallino. And the Winslow Prize in Romance Languages goes to Joanna Jean. Please congratulate our Achievement Prize winners. Now let us acknowledge our Writing Prize recipients. The Hutton Essay Prize goes to Ian Holm. The Dwight Lindley Prize to Lucas Purris. And the Alfred and Barrett Seaman Prizes in Writing go to Eleni Broadwell, Sunny Chen, and Aoife Thomas. Please congratulate our Writing Prize winners. Once again, congratulations to all of this year's award winners.